Hello and welcome back to Earth Optimism. I'm your host, Johannes Lamere, and on today's episode, we're going to explore an important question. Can human communities thrive without harming the animals and ecosystems they share? As the world's population grows, natural habitats and ecosystems are continually impacted. We'll look at three examples of how Smithsonian scientists are working with local communities to study the intersections of human activity and wildlife and environment. With more knowledge of animals and ecosystems and with input from people who live and work in an area, we can come up with science-based strategies for living better together. We're going to start in Myanmar to learn how people there are living with a sometimes destructive neighbors, the Asian elephant. The human elephant conflict really stems from the expansion of human activities and human populations. Elephant habitat is being cut down and cleared for agriculture or for oil palm plantations, for example. And they're finding themselves more and more pressed into the edges of uh, human settlements where they then will move in to feed in these disturbed areas. You often find them on these boundaries between intact forest and, and human activity because there's a lot of fresh green growth here that they'll come in and forage on. And for people, that means elephants engaging in crop raiding, and that brings them into conflict with humans. One elephant climb over there, so the floor is broken. He put a, a rice over there. Elephant is climbing over the, stepping on the floor, and the take the rice and they eat and they just run everything. When they hear the elephant and they, they run away along the road and reach the village. Everything is gone. Even a small group of elephants can destroy the livelihood of farmers. Despite the challenges of living around elephants, the overwhelming response we get from local people is that they want elephants around. They have a very strong social and cultural connection with elephants. They just really want to try to find a way to live with them and deal with those challenges. We have to offer solutions to people who are living amongst them. Part of that is working with Burmese partners who run education programs in schools and local villages to help people to learn how best to live with elephants peacefully. Compass Film make a short documentary so this is a kind of a, a joint program with our friends. So all these do's and don'ts. Uh, if the elephant charge, where they should run. If they live close to the elephant, how they should keep their food. I never all of the don't go the more they understand what elephant can do, it can reduce the conflict. It's by having these callers out there and getting that information that we're able to show people what's really happening and hopefully influence the, the future for these elephants. She moved a few kilometers this way and crossed the road, and then changed her mind and came back. And she moved straight line distance about three kilometers last night. She wound up crossing a stream here and crossing through a whole bunch of rice paddies. She could potentially have been feeding in there last night or just searching for a group. Is there something about the way certain elephants move that makes them more obvious crop raiders? Could we be able to predict which elephants are going to come into contact with humans more often? And can we give people an early warning system? Can we inform the local authorities that a certain elephant who might be more likely to get into trouble is moving into the area that would help people to overcome the challenges of living around elephants? Information about where they go helps us to learn a lot about how we might be able to protect them in future and protect people from losing their, their livelihoods.
The yellow bumblebee is native to the U.S. Once abundant, their numbers are in decline due to pesticide and other human factors. This bee is in a garden planted especially to be pollinator friendly. The more flowers there are, the better for the bees and the better for all of us. And now we're going to transition to the health of the world's forest, starting in Nigeria. One of the things we, we have to understand, especially those of us, the scientists, is that you cannot carry out conservation without a community. If you, the community is not in support and if you don't get, their, get them involved, then you would have a very big problem. Good morning, sir. Good morning, how are you? Fine. Almost everyone you find here, they are members of this community. So from the field assistants, from those involved in the Smithsonian project, the Smithsonian team, they're all members of the community. And I think this is a wonderful thing because it makes them part of what we're doing. Gineaki Hub is wonderful to our community. The project employed the people from Yelwa community only. We all know about the ecosystem services that forest provides and vegetation provides. We have serious challenges with deforestation. We have serious challenges with um, even places that are meant to be reserves being degraded and no one is saying anything. My goal in terms of conservation initially was to restore the forest. The Smithsonian has welcomed us into their family. They have allowed, in a sense, Ngalnyaki uh, to become part of this global network of forest plots. It is also the only Afro-Montane research plot. So I think there's a lot to be learnt from this plot. And the whole network, the CTFS Forest Geo Network, is so that we can share data, we can compare data, and also with the recent um, interest in climate change, I'm sure that the plot is going to make significant contributions into understanding global climate change. We know how the forest is in 2015. We will resurvey this plot um, every five years and we will see how things have changed. Because having such detailed information means that we can follow ecological change through time. I think that this place is hold for us and especially for the communities around so much benefit. And so I think that it's very important that this forest is maintained. The only way to do that is for us to have more research being done in areas that are still more novel in Nigeria and then also to have the government interested in what we are doing. I hope if you are here today, in 10 years coming, you will miss some places because they've become forests. This was a grazing area before that they were not free, but we have planted a lot. If you look at where our fence is, our forest is coming back. In 10 years coming, I think it will grow more than that. Let's take a look at what volunteer citizen scientists are doing to help monitor invasive species in the Pacific Ocean. Plant or animal species that move from their historical range are a force of ecological and evolutionary change. The Marine Invasions Lab at CERC hopes to understand patterns, processes, and consequences of invasive species of plants and animals. One way that the Marine Invasions Lab tracks fowling communities is by deploying PVC plates that hang off of docks and marinas. Over time, fowling communities populate on these plates. We then pull up the PVC plates, photograph them, and identify all of the organisms that have grown on the plates. A plate is actually a square PVC panel that we've cut and drilled holes into and we've attached to a brick. So this brick will hang off of a dock underwater for about three months. And 
The panels are where the photos are taken. So we'll take a photo from this part and, you'll, and things will settle on this while it's in the water. Because our scientists can't be everywhere at once, we use the help of citizen scientists to help collect data. This is what Plate Watch is. Plate Watch involves groups and classrooms to deploy their own plates. Citizen scientists pull up plates and take photos of them to send to our scientists for identification. Unfortunately, that creates quite a backlog of photos for our scientists to go through and identify. So we're trying a new method to identify invertebrates on plates on a platform called Zooniverse. So Zooniverse is our new project. We haven't ever done it before, and it's our, our way of trying to get more people to help us through your computers. Instead of going to classrooms, we're gonna have people do it in their own homes, do it on their own computers, on their own laptops, and just take our photos and get, give you a kind of brief introduction into what a marine invertebrate is, and then you could help us identifying species. Zooniverse allows citizen scientists all over the world to contribute to different research projects. The project is still in development and going through testing, but we'll let you know when we have more news to share. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Amy Johnson. She is a Smithsonian scientist who studies conservation in human-dominated landscape. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Johnson. In your experience as a Smithsonian scientist who works with communities to conduct research on wildlife, what is the role that communities can play in wildlife conservation, regardless of where in the world you are? Yeah, that's a great question. So I do my research in, here in Virginia, in the USA, and I work with communities pretty much all over the state. But then my Smithsonian colleagues are working with communities all over the world. And I think everybody would, would say the same thing, that conservation really takes a whole community. So as scientists, we are here to conduct the research that can help support conservation. But at the same time, we are looking to community members to help us conduct our science, to share knowledge of where the wildlife species are, what they're eating, um, who their prey are, who their predators are. Uh, and, and for us to be successful in our work, we absolutely need the community members to help us. So I work with farmers here in Virginia and I study bird species that are using their pastures. And I wouldn't be where I am today without the knowledge of the local farmers helping me with my research and sharing their knowledge of the land so that I can do my work better. Great. Now we have two questions from students in Indonesia who are participating in the U.S. Embassy English Access Program. Let's listen. Hi, my name is Jobel from Balikpapan and I am an alumnus of U.S. Embassy's English Access Micro Scholarship Program and I would like to know what young people like me can do to get involved with their communities and wildlife conservation. Thank you. Yeah, so as far as getting involved in conservation, I think growing up, I always felt like I needed to be either a veterinarian or a, a biologist or a scientist in order to do conservation work. But now that I'm a scientist, I realize that we need so much more than our scientists and our veterinarians and biologists to make conservation successful. So we need lawyers who are protecting wildlife. We need artists, we need storytellers, we need teachers. And uh, it really takes um, a whole community of people to make it successful. So I think what I would say is um, I would encourage you to think about what your best skills are and just take those skills and use those to your advantage as far as conservation goes. Um, for example, uh, growing up, I was I, I love working with people and I was also really good at biology, but math was always really difficult for me. So I, I used biology to my advantage and then I took extra courses in math to make me um, or bring me the skills that I need to be a successful scientist. Hi, my name is Jessica from Senior High School to Palangkaraya. And I'm the participant of U.S. Embassy's English Access Micro Scholarship Program. I would like to ask, what skills do you think are important for a conservation scientist working with communities to have? Thank you. Okay, so uh, as a scientist, I think it's really important to know what's called the scientific method. So that means being able to recognize where the conservation problems are 
um, how to ask questions that might be able to help you solve those problems. So in some cases, that's called making a hypothesis and then developing methods that can help you answer those questions. And in my case, I usually involve the communities in helping me um, throughout the scientific method. So I would say that one of the most important things for a scientist that I didn't learn until uh, I became a scientist is the importance of communication. Um, so learning how to involve community members in your work every step of the way. Um, and that will make your, your conservation work, I think, more successful in the long run. So I think a lot of people will tell me that they uh, became biologists because they didn't like working with people. But working with people is the most important part of conservation, as that is where the root of a lot of our issues start. So learn how to be a good listener. Um, it will help you be more successful in the long run, and it will help you align your conservation work with both the wildlife that you care so deeply about, as well as the communities that coexist with that wildlife. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for joining us. I think you might have inspired some young scientists in our audience. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. A place that you might not think about as a problem for a bird habitat is a coffee plantation. The Smithsonian has been working with coffee farmers to create bird-friendly, sustainable coffee farms to help support unique bird populations. Let's take a look at how this is working in South America. Somos defensores del bosque. Somos conscientes y creemos en el bosque. El cariño que le tenemos a las aves. Entonces, cuando nosotros conocimos su importancia, aparte de quererlas, hemos encontrado en ellas unos grandes eh, colaboradores. Les estamos dando a ellas un, un espacio para que vivan tranquilas y ellas con su trabajo nos están ayudando a mantener las plagas y enemigos de nuestro café alejados de nuestra plantación. Bird Friendly Coffee Program is a shade certification that has some very strict criteria. It's better than anything out there. The Smithsonian really does help protect habitat throughout Latin America and other parts of the world. The Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center conducted a lot of research to unearth which of the many benefits of growing coffee in this way is uh, best for birds. So from that research, we created a number of criteria. And growers who comply with these criteria are able to become bird-friendly certified. It's very important for us to belong to a process like bird-friendly. If you ask me about the coffee under the sun, I think it's much better que el café a libre exposición. We had higher temperatures. Rain intensity is really changing. In a shaded system like shade-grown coffee, and especially like bird-friendly coffee, the trees act as, a, as an umbrella for when there's intense rainfall. So we feel that these agroforestry systems can be a part of the solution to combating climate change.
hay café es amigo de las aves, que ayuda a la conservación, que ayuda a tener un sobreprecio y también valorarla. Para mí la cultura, la, el reto más grande en el tema de la caficultura es cambiarle la conciencia a los caficultores. Enseñarles sobre la importancia de tener sus reservas, la importancia de cuidar sus fuentes hídricas, la importancia de tener un café bajo sombra por sus múltiples beneficios, tanto como funciona como una sombrilla, como el sol, para evitar los rayos y para la lluvia, para evitar tanta agua que eso provoca derrumbes. que existe otra manera de cultivar café y una manera más ecológica y más amigable. I think that bird friendly matters because it's important for us to consider our impact in the environment and it's important for us to be aware of where our consumer products are coming from, how they're made, who makes them and how we consume them. No podemos limitarnos a pensar en nosotros, sino en la generación que viene y en las demás generaciones. Es por eso que nosotros nos vinculamos al proceso. Nosotros buscamos es con nuestro ejemplo poder motivar a más cultivadores y mostrarles que si se puede ser bird friendly. That was a great example of bringing commerce, communities, and wildlife together. Small changes can yield a big result. If you want to learn more about bird-friendly coffee or any of the other topics we saw today, please visit our website at earthoptimism.si.edu for more information and resources. And don't forget to be an Earth Optimist. Thank you and see you next episode.